Hey Squatchers, and welcome to the Temple of Shroom Squatch MycoVentures. Thank you for joining me for the Shroom Squatch Intro to Mycology using open air inoculation techniques. Open air inoculation means that you'll be able to cultivate mushrooms in the comfort of your own home without the use of a lab setting using simple yet effective open air techniques. At Shroom Squatch, my goal is to equip you with the knowledge, tools, and critical thinking skills to effectively engage the fungal kingdom. And by the end of this course, you'll have the knowledge and the ability to cultivate mushrooms in your own home cheaply and successfully time and time again. During this course, we'll learn how to align ourselves with the fungal path and how to use our newfound knowledge to squatch ourselves and our environment. You'll learn that the squatch is you, you. The, squatch the squatch is us. us. Before we begin the practice of cultivation, we'll discuss what makes fungi fungi and go over some general rules to remember during your cultivation so that you can have a successful journey. So join me in putting on your squatching pants and get ready to enter into the microverse. Spores are everywhere. They're in every breath you take and every bit of soil that you pick up and are believed to be responsible for a large portion of our rainfall. The fungi and the molds that are produced from spores are responsible for the majority of the decomposition on land, 80% in fact. The spore is the beginning and the end of the fungal life cycle. So that's where our conversation will begin today. When we discuss the nature of the spore, it is not just scientific, but it's also deeply poetic. In Radical Mycology, Peter McCoy is quoted as saying this about the spore life cycle. The spore is everything that the fungus represents. Whole, undivided, sovereign, it is a world unto itself a vessel of autonomy that, though seemingly just the same as countless others, holds within itself the untold legacies of bygone ancestors and of fungal webs yet to come. The spore is the beginning and the end of fungal evolution. It is the rest between the heartbeats and the network, the silence between the notes that the fruiting bodies sing, and the moment before the soil inhales. Resilient, inspired, and ancient, Spores are the still point from which storms arise to spawn whole communities and whole ecologies. She who counts the spores of the world is the one who measures the world itself. Fungi as spores, spores as fungus, fungi as life. One and the same, perfect and complete. Spores are the beginning and the end of the fungal life cycle. Everything that is contained within a fungal species or what a mushroom could become is contained within the spore. Different fungal species produce spores and create different types of sexual reproduction. A fruit body matures due to a variety of factors in the environment, one of which is the humidity and condensation in the atmosphere. As the fruit body matures and condensation builds up, it will start to open up where the spores are located. This usually occurs on the underside of the cap through that gill, pore, tube, spine mechanism. Once condensation builds up on the cap and rolls towards the underside of the cap, it encounters the spore. One tiny single water droplet is all that's needed for a spore to latch onto so that it can escape from the underside of the fruit body and into the atmosphere. Once the spore latches onto that water droplet, it will then be ejected from the underside of the mushroom at a rate of around 200 miles an hour. Of course, that encounters a lot of air turbulence once it's out of the mushroom fruit body itself. That's why when we see spores dropping, it doesn't look like they're being ejected at 200 miles an hour. It looks more like they're blowing in the wind. Once those spores are released into the environment, they then land into the substrate that they will start to grow mycelium in. They then can either reproduce sexually or asexually. This depends on the load of spores and on the primary mechanism of that fungal species. Spores are a single-celled, ungerminated gamete. Once the spore lands in the environment that it lives in, it will then germinate and either reproduce sexually or asexually. At the time where it encounters another spore to create that germination or reproduce on its own, it will then begin eating sugars from the environment and start digesting them and then absorbing them into the greater mycelial structure. That mycelium will run throughout the entire environment colonizing different parts of this carbon world that it lives in as it goes. It will determine which sugars are the best to eat 
Which ones are the easiest to break down? Also, what other barriers it might encounter, like contaminants that it doesn't want in its environment? Once all the conditions are perfect and it reaches that opportune moment, a fruit body will be produced, a mushroom. That mushroom, once it reaches maturity, loops us back to where we began, the dropping of the spore. So, for you to be successful, you're going to consider, what is my mycelium leaving in? Where does my mycelium want to go? What sugars does it want to eat? Am I giving it all the right conditions so that it can be successful and create new life? Cordyceps are a great example of how ascomycetes might reproduce in the wild. Cordyceps are known to have at least three different mating types. If one mating type encounters another one mating type, that one mating type could switch to a two or three mating type so that it can mate with the one mating type, thus continuing a new line of genetics and DNA so that it can continue to produce fruit bodies. Cordyceps obviously need to produce a fruit body to be able to continue to grow. If we don't have that reproduction through the fruit body, then what we encounter is called senescence. And this is where all vegetative growth has stopped. To put it simply, the mycelium will run through a structure, but it will never produce a fruit body. So for ascomycetes to continue to reproduce through sporulation, they need to be able to form fruit bodies. And this is why senescence is an important factor when we're looking at different fungal species. Ascomycetes and basidiomycetes use mushrooms as the primary form of reproduction due to the fact that they are the ones that produce spores. This is not the case with all fungal species. In fact, the phylum of Glomeromycota never produces a single fruit body, yet it's believed that it forms a relationship with 80% of plant species that it encounters. The primary function of a mushroom is sexual reproduction through sporulation. Having a variety of spores go out into the environment ensures that the genetic line and the variance in the DNA is going to be high enough that they can continue to vegetate and continue to reproduce as a species. The Basidiomycetes are different from ascomycetes in that they don't produce spores via an asca on the organism itself. Instead, they'll oftentimes grow gills or pores, and that is where the spores will be dispersed into the environment. They can also remain in a single haploid state for their entire life cycle. Now, I'm not gonna get into all of the micro science of what that is, but that's the main thing that's gonna make a basidiomycete different. It's also the thing that you're gonna think of most often when you think of mushrooms. These are your things like your oyster mushrooms, your turkey tails, your shiitake, your rishis, the things that you're always kind of Imagining when you imagine a mushroom, sure, some of you probably think of cordyceps, but most of you are probably thinking about basidiomycetes. And that's what I'm teaching you to grow today. We're focusing on basidiomycota. The number one defining factor that makes a fungi a fungi is the structure of its cell walls. Its cell walls are made up of a combination of chitin cells and glucan sugar cells. These are plant glucans, essentially. Those two actually exist together in a symbiosis that creates the cellular wall that makes up all of the mycelial tissue and the mushroom itself. This cellular structure occurs in no other kingdom and is what is responsible for the rigidity of the mushroom fruit body itself. The majority of the cell wall is made up of the plant glucans and the remainder is the chitin. Chitin is what is found in the exoskeleton of insects and it's also found in all crustaceans like your lobsters, and your shrimps, and your crabs. That's the shell part. It's all chitin. Another thing that makes fungi unique is how it eats. And nutrition of fungi is one of the most important things for you to continue to think about as you move forward through this cultivation video. Let's define what a mycelial structure is. This is that combination of plant and chitin tissue coming together to create a cell wall that creates a structure that is a mycelial tissue. That is the majority of the fungal organism. That's the stuff that you're gonna see on these plates. And it's also the stuff that you're gonna see running through your substrate that's actually breaking down all of the nutrition and the carbon as it moves throughout its substrate world. There are two basic types of mycelial growth that we'll discuss today. The first is tomentose growth. This is a cottony type of structure that you'll often see on oyster mushrooms or reishi mushrooms, which is what's on this plate. This cottony growth ends up having a very 3D appearance as it colonizes the substrate that it's growing on. And it can be harder to identify specific structures contained within the mycelial organism. 
However, once you get familiar with what these terms are and what you should be looking at when you're looking at a mycelial mat, whether on a plate or in a substrate, you'll know how to identify exactly what makes this structure look like this and what makes this structure look like this. And it all pretty much comes back to how they break things down. That's their nutrition. The second type of growth that we'll discuss is rhizomorphic growth. This comes from the term rhizome, which is essentially a tube that comes off of a greater organism and goes out and gathers food and sends it back to the organism as a whole. You can think about aspen trees. They also do this. They are one organism. So one tree is actually the same as another tree, even though they're their own trees, they're all still the same organism. You can think of aspen trees as the larger example of how mycelium works. You can think of larger ecosystems as a greater organism of mycelium. And you see how this mycelial idea can just spread and spread and spread. So when we look at rhizomorphic growth, what we're looking at and we're identifying is what we would call hyphae. These exist in tomentose growth, though they're a little bit harder to identify. Over time, you'll start to notice what specific hyphae are present even in tomentose growth. With rhizomorphic growth, it's gonna be easier for you to, to identify specific parts of the mycelial structure. This has to do with the fact that it usually produces very dominant looking hyphae. Hyphae are the structures of mycelium that go out and release enzymes into the environment that then cleave apart sugars and break them down. They're also seen through these tubes that show that they're leading away from a greater organism and outwards so that they can begin to try to break apart sugars and bring them back to the whole organism. In the end of every hyphae is a hyphal tip. And within that hyphal tip is an organelle called a spitzenkorper, named after the guy that discovered it. It's essentially a small brain that produces enzymes and then puts them out into the environment that breaks those sugars apart. Then a fairly complex organic chemistry problem occurs and the hyphae can then absorb those sugars back into the whole organism. In the instance of rhizomorphic growth, those hyphal tubes essentially become highways that spread the sugars throughout the whole mycelial organism. The Spitzenkorper organelle is also responsible for making decisions about whether or not to continue to colonize that area and break down more sugars. But why or why not a mycelial structure may do that is all an assumption on our part. However, one thing we do know is that it's pursuing the easiest and greatest amount of nutrition for it to break down and then absorb. Based on which enzymes break down which sugars and how that whole organic complex comes together depends exactly on where that hyphae is going to travel and what it's going to choose to start to break down for the greater organism itself. As enzymes are released and carbohydrates are broken into smaller chunks that the mycelium can absorb, the mycelium starts to produce waste. And this is in the form of metabolites. These metabolites are essentially ureic acid. So this is mushroom pea. I discussed this a little bit more later, but one of the things that you need to note when it comes to cultivation is that that urea is essentially all around that mycelium. And in the natural world, they will release a secondary enzyme for bacteria to get invited and come in and consume the mycelial waste. When we cultivate in an artificial environment, we don't have that same mechanism. So we have to pay attention to our metabolite production. Metabolites are not always a bad thing. However, an overproduction of metabolites could create an acidic environment, which fungi in general do not like to be in. It could also invite other bacteria to come in and consume those metabolites, and they might be bacteria that we don't want. In short, we want to manage our metabolite production so that we don't invite things in that could cause contamination or create an acidic environment that fungi don't like to exist within. When working with different fungal species and understanding the different nutrition that each fungi likes, we'll start to understand that we can use the same substrates with different species so that we can use up all of the carbon and all of the nutrition that's contained within a single carbon substrate. When it comes to feeding a substrate to several fungal species, you can think of it as fungal succession planting. You could introduce a substrate to a lion's mane species. The lion's mane will eat a lot of the simple carbohydrates out of that species, but it won't break down the lignin as aggressively as something like an oyster or a shiitake mushroom. Once you've spent a substrate from growing out lion's mane, you could then feed it 
to shiitake or oyster to further reduce the amount of lignin in that block and use the very same substrate. The application and implications for what this could do for sequestering carbon substrates on our planet is vast. So when you're looking at how fungi eat, think about what sugars are they eating? Why do they want to eat them? And then think about how can I take that carbon and apply it elsewhere? Another major thing that makes fungi unique is the fact that it breathes oxygen and exhales CO2. Remembering this is very important when it comes to actually fruiting mushrooms. Some mushrooms like a higher CO2 environment. They don't need as much oxygen and they actually thrive off of the carbon dioxide. However, every mushroom needs some oxygen because this is their primary source of respiration. Mushrooms don't produce chlorophyll like plants do. So that means that the way that they eat is unique because they eat more like we do as people where they have to actually consume the nutrients from the environment that they're living in. Throughout the digestive process, fungi also store nutrients in the form of sugar alcohols, tree halose, and glycogen. The reason that this whole digestive process matters to how we cultivate is so that we can begin to think critically about what they're doing in their environment so that we can have the most success when it comes to working with them in their environment. At Shroom Squatch Micro Ventures, our goal is to help you be a successful mushroom cultivator. Our greater goal is that hopefully by the end of this course and throughout your entire process working with mushrooms, you'll start to learn to think critically about your role in the life of fungi and fungi's role in your own life. As we start to look at the fungal species and how it operates with us and how we can interact with it, we'll also start to see how it interacts with other species. The planet doesn't need us to stay here. The planet will be okay. It will take care of itself. When we say that we need to save our planet, that comes with a massive amount of hubris and ego. What we instead need to do is learn to sit and be still with our planet, to stop and to listen, and to see how all of these things come together so that we can be a better part of the greater mycelial structure that exists on our planet. In the Tao Te Ching, it says 30 spokes share one hub. And that's what we're looking at when we look at fungi. We're looking at a hub of mycelium, that it all comes back to center. And for us and our participation in our own ecological system, it will be helpful for us to do the same. So as we move forward through this course, I encourage you to always think critically about the next step that you're doing, how it influences another. It's not unlike working on a car, but it's also not unlike sitting next to a river and just taking it all in.